Hi there. Hi. <laughs> I'll make you co-host. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hola. Hello. Um, <laughs> Maggie, good good afternoon. Uh, is it morning for you? <laughs> it's barely still morning. Is it really? I'll, I'll make you co-host, Maggie, um, for okay. convenience. You know. Yep. Go right ahead. Uh, make co-host. Do you want to be co-host, Marco, so you don't feel left out? <laughs> <laughs> no, Julia, I'm I'm all right. I've got a couple You're of right. people. <laughs> a co-host party. <laughs> okay. Thank you, though, for thinking about it. <laughs> Stop my cup of tea as well. <laughs> see, see, I couldn't possibly feel left out. Not at all. <laughs> oh, Linda's in now as well. <laughs> yes. How are? How is everyone? We're doing well. Yeah. Well, uh... You've had a birthday since uh, since we last met, Maggie. Did. I had a birthday and last night we were able to go to a restaurant and Brilliant. celebrate. That yes. was surprising. But yes, for my yeah. birthday, I went to the lake and we have many lakes here. So really it's beautiful. Oh, sounds beautiful. Yes, lovely. <laughs> but there's um one of the great lakes. So it's like, it's like an ocean. So um, you go you go there, you can't for miles, there's nothing but lake. Um, yeah. But there was a little uh, peninsula sort of going out into the into the lake. So we were able to hike out about a mile in up to the where the um, edge of the peninsula. There was a little lighthouse there so we could be surrounded by the lake for oh, a very a brief time. It was very oh. snowy. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. Dodie's arrived. I'll, I'll let her in. Ciao, Linda. Hi. Hello, Linda. Hello. I'm yeah. glad we were able to make it happen. Uh, I yes. know it's very last minute, so we'll see if folks yeah. are able to make it. And if not, then we'll just try again. Yeah. We will do it and do it again. Now, I think are we. I think we're recording this. I'll just pause. <laughs> Nobody has to require that. Um, I What's do think the... that for fiction, there's a lot to dig into, though. Mm -hmm. And if anybody has any context as we're reading about the places or the objects or anything else that comes up, feel free to share your screen if you want to show anything or put a link in the chat. Any of those things can make this a richer experience. And you can always share it on email later if you want to do that. So we're here for our very first meeting, uh, uh, discussing the first couple chapters of Dorian Valiente's uh, fiction compilation, The Witch's Ball. And I think we said we were going to do one through five, one through four, something like that. Did everybody get a chance to read it? Sadly, my, my book arrived uh, midweek this week. I haven't had time to read. I'm supposed oh. to speak about Wookie, the night in Wookiee Hall. That's, that's no. next time. So you're good. Yeah, you've got time. Woo! Uh, and, and there's really no need to worry about that. They're very short chapters. So yeah. even if you just wanted to sit here and read with us, you could. But um, I really, I really liked this. <laughs> I loved her format. The characters, she's got two characters, A and B, uh, Ashton and was it Blake, who kind of become the, the, the little polarity within the larger polarity of her stories. So you got this elderly wise man who knows things and this younger man who's fascinated by it um i was definitely put in mind of dion fortune's style sea priestess very like evocative and some mysterious things and some ordinary things wrapped in mystery i love it um the characters are antique sellers and they seem to kind of come in and out of each other's lives over time. You've got a various reasons for them to get together at a, an, a like um, an event. And sometimes they're by the sea and sometimes they're at a cottage and sometimes they're, so we, we kind of walk our way through the elements as the stories progress, starting with the ocean um, in Brighton. And each story has uh, some feelings behind it and brings 
Blake a little closer to understanding maybe Ashton's background and why he's sharing all this information. Uh, but the stories themselves seem kind of you know, sort of ordinary Gothic story types. Does anybody have any thoughts about the, the stories as a whole so far? I mean, like, how, what do you think? Are they good? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I just want to say that I was surprised. Um, I had, I haven't, I mean, <laughs> I haven't embarrassingly read anything else by her. And I love the old fashioned um, folklore, the Gothic horror without all the blood and gore, the high, you know, horror films give you. And I was like, this is really cool. <laughs> So I absolutely love it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to throw that in there right away. Yeah. It definitely felt very cozy reading it, but it, and, and it, it was clear what was going on in each story. I don't think she was trying to trick us in any way. We were the ones in the know, and and Blake was the one who was surprised and wide eyed, but but none of it is particularly scary. <laughs> So from an author's perspective, because I've also done an awful lot of writing myself, I do read in a different way. It's not exactly more analytical, but it's, it's you know, once you know how to do a ballet and you see a ballerina, you really understand what goes into those moves. And I have had, you know, I've read a lot of uh, well, many of the other uh, books from Doreen and a different flavor. It's a completely different flavor when she writes poetry versus when she writes her folkloric prose. And this fictional piece I thought was very interesting. It uh, has the, it's almost a trope to have, you know, the mentor and then the person who's the seeker or the person who's learning. And uh, it's the same kind of setup with uh, Carlos Castaneda and Don Juan, you know, it's the same kind of mentor except that with Castaneda, it's a completely different experience. The other thing is that at the time that Doreen was writing this, um, you know, in terms of when witchcraft was becoming more popular, how it was surfacing in society, how people were becoming aware of it, really varied in um, the sort of overall media you have, it usually surfaced through horror. It was either horror or spiritualism. And the fiction in between, it's, it's, I think this is an excellent, excellent job of being able to demonstrate some of the wonderful little clues, you know, the, <laughs> the approaches, and it keeps some of the spiritual intact and some of the ceremony intact and some of the energetic awareness that one has to have, but it doesn't hit you over the head in terms of being an instructive book. It really you into the story so I thought that was really really well done considering just all the different forms of media what people might have come across in this genre before and it's, really I just yes yeah absolutely I'm put in mind of, of Gardner's very stumbling efforts to try to uh, share the, the witch's craft in his fiction and how you know struggle to read that that fiction is, uh, and this is much easier flowing. And, you know, we feel that same way about, about the unfortune too. It's like, so yeah. it's, it's so engaging and, and fairly well written and has a plot and things like that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So beautifully done. Yeah. It's interesting. I also uh, like that it starts with warning in a way. Sorry, <laughs> I think that's great to warm up the reader. Start looking at all the things that you should probably keep an eye open for if you're if you're new to it. <laughs> so that, oh, look at that! And I love the art. I think it's just lovely. the The artist is a tattoo artist. Yeah. Um, is she a friend of yours, Julie? Yes, yeah, so I met her at Witch Fest, which is um, a well known um, annual. Well, it was before COVID, an annual event in the UK. And um, uh, she knew my husband, John, as well, very well. And she's always supported us and she donated the 
pen and ink drawings for each chapter. <laughs> and then she got really worried about it because, she said, oh, I don't know if it's suitable. Yes, yeah. it is. You know, we had to reassure her. They're, they're beautiful. Uh, you can tell her that it's very nice. Very nice. Yes, I will. T oh, your pussycat. <laughs> this, this is Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. He is very busy and loud. So I apologize. I'll mute him if he gets uh, very loud. Anybody else yeah. just in general? Any themes that really leapt out at you? I mean, for me, it was that elemental thing. So I was looking kind of like, we'll, we'll point him out as we go. But uh, I'll, uh, and, the, and the polarity in each chapter, the first one. Yeah, the polarity. Shows up. It's pretty clear. So. Yeah. What, what I liked about it, um, I think, was the way that she used like artifacts and the fact that they're all old or the places. It was either places or objects. And it, what I learned was that, you know, what old things can absorb. And you've got to be really careful, I think. But it makes me more interested in like antiques and objects and what what magical history they may have. And it just whet my appetite really for 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 looking for things, um, ancient things, but ancient places as well. It's like going into the woods, the green man, the the history of the yew trees. I love that one. Um, the 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 brooch with the vampire. Um, the ball I actually what I actually ended up doing when I read the witch ball was actually finding one myself so I've got one now and it was just like not that I'm going to use it it's just there it reminds me of the story um and the places and I suppose because I, I I'm lucky enough to live near some of these places and they're familiar to me it brings them all alive um it's, it's they're just wonderful I love them and it's the second time I've read them and they just meant more this time I was looking for clues, the clues that they brought to me. And and, and you mentioned actually, um, Maggie, about the sea priestess mm -hmm. and the writing. And what I actually did last week, I read the sea priestess. Wow. Um, the <laughs> and I'd had it on my shelf for about a year and I'd started reading it and I found it too heavy. Mm -hmm. And um, I started reading this again. And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to give that a go. And I just read it in about three days and it was just like, wow. And I can see the parallels of, 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 of what they're trying to teach you. And I felt as well with um, Charles, Charles Ashton was, I felt that he was like an alter ego possibly of Doreen, that she may have been using him as to tell the story, but I felt like it was really her. I don't know whether anyone else thought that, but that's what it brought to me a little bit. I will reserve judgment until we get to the end. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. no, it's valid. I think you can just just make choices as you go. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Very good. I'm so delighted that you read. That was a nice connection. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really funny because you mentioned it, and then I thought, oh wow, well, I, I literally finished it yesterday. And um, the writing style—I mean, it's very old-fashioned, isn't it? And you've got to get your head around that and. Yeah. I imagine you know if you you're not if you're over the pond as well, it's slightly more difficult with the old. In, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's me being a assumption. Assumptions really. Definitely. Yes. But getting around that old way that the, the and and obviously the witch ball is written in an era where we don't talk like that anymore. But I love that as well. Mm -hmm. Can you can transport yourself back in time a little bit? For sure, yeah. Marco, and then and then Dodi. Did you have something, Marco? So, oh, but I did, but I, uh, please, Dodi, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to bounce off something that, that you just said, Christine, about the language of these stories. And I, I full disclosure, Sea Priestess is like one of my favorite curl up with a cup of tea reads. I've read that book so many times. And twice, yeah. twice I've, I've, my own books, the book study group that I facilitate here has read through it. And absolutely. People here, particularly younger people, really stagger and stumble with the language because it is from a different time. But I always challenge people to rise to that challenge um, because it it just it it it's just so great to have that that mm. language power under your belt. You know, it's it's uh, it's just gorgeous. You yeah. know, we don't we don't dumb down Shakespeare. You know, people mm. still 
enact Shakespeare's plays on stage using that language. And, you know, I think as people who are interested in occult writing, it's really important that we challenge ourselves like that too. And reading books like, like this one and, you know, even Gardner's fiction, which is, I share Maggie's feelings about, um, it's kind of cool that these writers wrote our instructional like type books but then it's almost like a secret little treat that they wrote us some fiction too mm -hmm. and that we're in on the joke with them you know we were like backstage at the show with those books and i love that and um I, i'm a writer as well and the the stuff of mine that's been published has been nonfiction, but it may, really makes me crave and i've got it all up here to, to mm -hmm. put some of my short stories down on paper yeah, yeah. and and i would hope that I could do the same thing where I could sh have those little backstage little, you yeah, know, yeah. only other witches are going to get this one. I'm going to put this yeah. there. My friends, right. You know, it's, it's just, yeah. it's fun to think you've got that yummy little, you know, secret that, that, you know, only the witches will know. It's fun. It is. It is. Um, and, and like you, I mean, I, I've written, um, written a book. It's going to be published shortly. Um, but it's a children's book. Um, it's children's fiction. It is a witch book, and um, I've tried to hide the secrets in that as well. And I learned that from from reading Doreen's short stories. I really did. I mean, when I read this two years ago, that's what got me me writing. And so I share that. And I've been throwing them in as well, but it's it's aimed at children. Um, so yeah, it's exciting. It's, oh, I've learned absolutely. a lot. Very much. Congratulations. Okay. Read all of your work. <laughs> I'm also a writer under another name uh, and have written lots of cheesy romance novels. And um, I'm not going to share them with any of you, but I think it's nice to know that we're in good company. <laughs> well, maybe we go ahead. You, you have been waiting. Go ahead. Were you talking to me, Maggie? Uh, well, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm astonished that our little book club is in reality an author's club. I, I love it because obviously for people like me, I'm definitely not an author. I write, but unfortunately not books. Uh, just very, very boring papers. Anyway, um, it's a privilege, obviously, for me. It's a privilege because it... it who gets the chance to, to have a book club and, and, and speak with authors all the time? Who well, obviously you all have clearly. Uh, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's facilitated, but I think it's uh, well-deserved, um, more in-depth, probably, uh, view on, on, uh, on the books, on the stories. Um, I only read the first, so the one we're talking about today, the first short story. Mm. I really liked it. Um, First of all, I just want a confirmation for you from you lot. Uh, is that correct that a witch ball is that glass thing that in reality is a uh, uh, fishing? Um, how's it called? It's is it there, Julie? I see you're nodding. It's a fishing. <laughs> well, how's it called again? Um, float. What? Yeah, float. A float. A float. Yes. Yes. I think um, this wish this witch ball is mirrored. That's a that's a fishing float that Christine's holding yeah. up. But I, I think people, if you can see into if you can scry into it, then you could use it as a fish uh, as a witch ball, couldn't you? So I remember <laughs> that that thank yeah. you, Christine. Um I've got a little bit of history with that because <laughs> It happened to me since I started my path on the Reen's store in general. That, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm into material culture a lot. And every time I meet a new object by the Reen, magically, as you would say, it appears in my life. Mm -hmm. So that's the last object that appeared uh, a few years ago. I didn't have a clue of what it was. I just, I was reading one of her books and she mentioned about scrying into something much cheaper than a crystal ball. And we don't have that in Italy. We, I've never seen anything like that. So the day after I went to a car boot sale 
and I saw it. Really? Oh, yeah, that's a, well, that's one of three synchronicities about her objects. So I've got one with me now. But this is another case. Yes, you've got one of those, yeah. I saw it on the charge of the goddess mm. and then it appeared. So I was a little bit, you know, um, <laughs> it's interesting. I do love this. I do agree with all of you. The style is so, it's so elegant and mm. old. And I really like that. Um, I like that she started with a good uh, Latin uh, maxima, which is always <laughs> interesting. And, uh, but to be fair, I, I'm learning more now from all of you because you, you made some comments I'm so intrigued by. I never, I'm going to say it loud, yes, I never read The Unfortune. Not sure. Actually, I read one of her books, but it's uh, uh, Psychic Self-Defense, so not really what we're talking about. <laughs> and you made me very curious, and I never realized what you were saying, Dodi, as well, about the fact that these books for us have a different meaning from the regular reader. It is so interesting. I didn't realize that. Uh, but I wonder, does the author realize that? Do, do you think it's 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 something thought? She wanted to sort of say something, but also sort of um, giving the eye to to the fellow witches. Mm. I, I believe that Dion Fortune did that on purpose, didn't she? Didn't she hide the teachings in novels because at that. The four I, novels, each of them were the, the yeah. levels of the of the tree of life. So she, yeah. that was very um, instructively specific. She wanted to mm -hmm. like teach about this one in this novel and this one in this novel. And there's lots of writings about that for the unfortunate. But you can, as a witch, read it and go, oh yeah, I recognize that you know that ritual mm -hmm. or feel like that's really resonates with me or whatever, whatever you know. So yes, absolutely. There's there's layers and layers, whether or not she intended i think doreen probably definitely intended to have this be an instructive um yeah. sort of occult as she defines it as hidden um uh, message to those who were in the know she does that kind of a lot i have a question about the language um um at what point will it become archaic and nobody will be able to understand it and should we modernize the book or would it get lost in the translation? Uh, you know, I, I think the language is really powerful. And if we keep if we keep dumbing things down, you know, then it'll be dated the wrong way in the future again. You know, mm -hmm. um, if, if yeah, I think it's just great to hear her words as she wrote them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then I probably agree. at some point, someone, if if really the language uh, evolves too much, or someone will study the text and will publish a, a commentary. Is that how you say it in English? Oh, yes, Annotated probably. edition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. that probably would, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say something. For, I mean, I haven't had anything published, but I do write and I've been to a lot of different writers retreats and conferences and I and there are two people that come to mind um, who were saying, you know, I asked advice on from and they said to me, you know, because people have other people have been saying to me, oh, you need to make it gritty and edgy and da 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 and change the language and all this and I do tend to write in kind of um, an odd style. And two people specifically at one of these retreats said to me, never mind what they say, it doesn't have to be edgy, it doesn't have to be gritty, it just have to, has to have a meaning, you know, something from your heart and go with that. And, and then, you know, the people will find, people will find, readers will find what is important to them, you know, the style that works for them. And, and, and this is a really good example for me going, this sort of thing still exists because yeah. I, I get tired of grippy and edgy all the time. So to <laughs> me, this is like a lifeline. It might be for others. Yeah. Yes. That's just what everybody tell you. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, find I would say there's no need to change the language. Mm. This, this no. is very accessible and, and uh, yeah. For those who've, uh, uh, read Tolkien or who've read C.S. Lewis. I mean, 
I read those when I was a child and that was already archaic then. But of course, this is it. You learn as you read. And so I think that it's a marvelous experience for people to read it in, in the author's original voice because that's how it really comes mm -hmm. across. Yeah. And I also think it was super clever if I could just uh, go back to the topic that we were on before in terms of the you know, the, the witches giving each other the nod kind of thing. What I really thought was lovely about this was that you can read this as somebody who is completely new to any of the magic and you can relate from the perspective of the character of Blake and otherwise those who have learned generally also find ways to share it. You know, we, it's, it's something that comes out in, in the way that we talk about the world in general, it sort of always carries a little bit of an inspirational light. And then you can relate more to the Ashton character if you've ever been in this sort of teaching position as well. So it, you get a chance to relate from both sides. And I also found that it was remarkably accessible, makes the, the story becomes remarkably accessible when she includes these wonderful little details about what they had for tea or what they would have for lunch. And just being able to feel like you're sitting down to a cup of tea or a nice sifter of brandy or something with the characters. And that's, that's something else that comes up a lot in some of the more successful pieces of fiction as well. It's, it's something that's relatable. And then you can have all these wonderful things changing in terms of environment and fabulous objects and things like that. So. I just, uh, did anybody else pick up on the, um, yeah. those little yeah. sort of like touch points of, yeah, yeah communi mm -hmm. kind of communing in, in between worlds? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like stories were a bit spooky, but you know, it was in a very kind of normalized setting, which made you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to read, it's pleasant. It's not gonna spook you out if, if you're new to it as well, you know? And I think that was intentional, the, the mm. setting it in a familiar, comfortable, including lots of you know, sort of gentle, ordinary details. Mm -hmm. And then the contrast of the sort of hidden undercurrent of what is going on and, mm. and being able to reveal that a little bit at a time and have that be a little uneasy. So that's a, I think that's really important. Wow. Dodie, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Well, I, I think a lot of this, I, you know, I, I just got this in the mail this week. And the first thing I did is I, I, sk I skimmed through the book and I, I caught um, the thing that caught my eye was what you wrote, uh, Julie, in the editor's forward. And the, I think the very first paragraph that Julie wrote kind of sets it off. And when she says, when my late husband, John Bellum Payne, and I found the manuscripts for these delightful short stories, among the collection that Doreen Valiente bequeathed to him, we said that we must share them by publishing them. Mm -hmm. You know, doesn't that say it all? And immediately I was, when I was sitting there, you know, having just torn this out of the envelope it was sent to me in, I just sat there thinking about, you know, my very limited, uh, you know, relationship with Julie um, and just imagining what her face must have looked like when she was finding this manuscript and like, oh, we have to share these, like, like what, what, you know, you had that original experience and then you and John took the initiative to share this. Yes. But, you know, how, how did that feel? Like, what, what, sharing it? Um, well, finding them, finding them and reading finding them. them. Well, the, there's a story about that. When um, Doreen's, um, next of kin was Ray Cook, who was Ron Cook. Ron Cook was her partner, magical and boyfriend. And um, Ray Cook was his son, but she didn't have a next of kin as, a, as in a son or a child or a husband. So he was her next of kin. He ex executed the will and her will only said magical artifacts to John. Um, and he interpreted that as not the paperwork and he was going to chuck it all away 
and John begged him, don't chuck the paperwork away, we don't know what's in it, it might be magical, it might re there'll be information in there about all the artefacts that she's amassed and things like that. Um, so Ray Cook gave John the paperwork and this was within the paperwork. So we, we felt we really should actually publish it while strike while the iron's hot basically <laughs> um, and that's how the paperwork came about also all of those notebooks that everyone keeps talking about um, John promised that he would never publish those and yet we find people have copied them all over the internet but anyway uh, on that basis, Ray said, OK, I'll give it to you then, because these are her private notebooks and they, they contain references to living people and um, please be careful with them. So uh, that's why we published it, really. We, we thought we'll, we'll do it while he's still <laughs> happy for us to do it, you know, and before he changes his mind which he did, which, no, he hasn't changed his mind. He's he's completely gone off the scene now anyway. I don't know even if he's still alive, R Ray Cook. And then subsequently there was her library of about 2,000 books and at her funeral in front of everybody there he said, we don't know what to do about the library of 2,000 books. He was a bailiff. He His job in real life was to empty apartments when people died and dispose of the thing. He was just saying, I I've got to empty this flat because the council want to put a new tenant in there. So we, he said, would you like the books as well? <laughs> so we said, oh, we'll do you a favour <laughs> of the books as well. So all of a sudden our barn, which had been used for circling and teaching and uh, groups, was suddenly full up of Doreen's stuff, um, which was, and that's how the story unfolds. So that's where we are now. <laughs> Can we just sit here and listen to you talk about that for the entire hour? I think that would be, <laughs> that's what I want to know. Like, I want to know, I'm the librarian, who's where? The, the library <laughs> <laughs> well um they were we did bring them over to spain when we moved to spain um the where where we started the center for pagan studies in sussex it was prone to flooding and we decided to sell up and i was quite ill at that time as well so we came to spain because um, people say it's good for your health and things. it has been good for my health um, and we packed everything up and brought it to Spain and since then before Brexit I had to get it all back over to England um, a couple of years ago because um, transport with customs and borders were looking a bit dodgy you know if you're going to send a, an ivory Gerald Gardner's wand over to England before Brexit would have been quite easy but after Brexit it might have been very complicated <laughs> so, so we've got it all over including the library it's all in England at the moment and there's an archive facility where we've put the paperwork um, to, to preserve it and um, the library with in talks to for them to have that as well um and it contains many books which uh you know doreen would have a a way of um writing in green biro in the right. margins of books in her little notes saying well, why the hell did they say that it didn't you know what on earth are they talking about um, <laughs> <laughs> little notes like that uh, if you have you just go through the books and you, you open them and something comes up like that, you know, a little annotation. Uh, so the library in itself is really, should be treated as an artifact. Right. Um, and that's... Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's as a museologist, he, know, he knows, yes. I agree with Julie. Well, yes. I, I in general agree with Julie, but, but even more about this. 
Yes, so it's a problem to know what to do because you can't have it as a lending library. That's not how human nature works, unfortunately. Um, as a reference library is probably the best thing, and I think... That's a collection, yeah. Yes, that's what we're working towards with this uh, archive facility in, in Sussex. So let's that's hope great. it happens to make it accessible to everyone. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. We um, we have a lot of Doreen in these stories. Yes. There's, I don't remember who said it, but that, that the character of Ashton is kind of Doreen-ish. And in, in her nonfiction, it sounds like this. She yeah. does talk like that. She writes like that. I've never like heard her talk, so I don't know really how she sounds. But I, I think that she she comes across in her in her prose. Uh, so I think that's really cool. Uh, I do I, think, um, yes, uh, she would have made contact with antiques dealers in Brighton because she would rummage around the antiques shops looking for things. Mm -hmm. And I think she probably befriended quite a lot of them and quite knew them quite well sometimes, got to know about them behind the, you know, the business mm -hmm. face. I think she probably did get to know them better. And this writing is probably a little bit from her own experience <clears throat> yeah i'm curious to know why she chose these specific things to talk about dodi did you did you have something well it's it's I'm, maybe i'm just kind of going down a rabbit hole here and getting a bit obscure but um another one of my sort of uh pet favorite witches from the past is sybil leak and she also had an, a connection to antique stores Yes, and I, I have this like fantasy about all these marvelous, powerful witch women having these these connections to antique shops, and it it draws it's it influences me and my behavior, you know, mm -hmm. and my my uh, tendency to go looking you know in thrift shops and finding like creepy objects in antique <laughs> shops, especially when I Winnipeg is not really a great place for antique shops but definitely when i'm in the uk mm, yes. you know it, it's it's absolutely delicious to go loiter in an antique shop so mm. it uh, my priestess um who is now uh, quite elderly and she would hate to have me say that i hope she doesn't watch this video um uh it, but whenever we would drive down to Kentucky to the witchy gatherings that we would go to, we would stop an antique on the way. And that was very much a part of our travel across the country to the state where we had our campground events and come back and yes. Yes. <laughs> now I want to write a story with all of the witchy women uh, who have a connection through thrift shops and can transport themselves from one to the other across the world. Maybe I through the artifact because every artifact has got a history it's been touched by other people and it's been in various situations and it's probably carrying its own DNA throughout history as well Absolutely. so that's I think that's why we like our antiques <laughs> which but, is like antiques and in, in a time before you know the neighborhood witch shop where yeah. else would you go find uh, a very a very bizarre looking dagger or a cauldron or a crystal mm -hmm. ball like those would have come from antique shops you know and, and in the UK all these delicious items that would have been brought from you know trips abroad by you know folks who went you know traveling across you know yeah. exotic places bringing all these strange ivory handled daggers and and weird lumps of stones or fossils back from mm -hmm. from their travels of course, they're going to be in an antique shop or a flea market or a car boot sale, right? Like yeah. all the best stuff. Yeah, it's the mm -hmm. fascination of where it's been and how it got there. Yes. <laughs> and the implication that sometimes it's inappropriate to touch it and sometimes yes. it's perfectly acceptable to touch it. Yeah. And like mm -hmm. being able to know when and how and, and, and to trust your instinct. That's a very big part, I think, of being a familiar with yes. the culture and I, I think maybe process. That's, sorry. go ahead no you're no, good say maybe that was what Doreen was trying to say in the witch ball uh with regards um you know how to handle objects that have been possibly 
interfered with or you got absorbed some kind of negativity and maybe that was the clue in the first book that's what that was about maybe yeah that's just appeared to me yeah she's always teaching us whatever she writes anyway yeah yeah. trying to teach us (laughs) and for those of you who read that that bit do you think there were some teachings in that story in the witch ball that um that she was trying to get across like like you said uh christine i I definitely do yes what did you notice julie well I, i noticed um that uh, its caveat emptor is a warning. Um, be careful what you buy. But it's also, I think it's a double meaning what she says. Be careful with the object that you buy as well. Um, and uh, Or take care of the object that you buy. Because you could translate it from Latin in that way. And the ending where the couple get divorced Mm. and he says, I wonder which one got the witch ball, got custody (laughs) of the witch ball. (laughs) Like, um, which one's got the witch ball? Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, we don't know, but um, it's to do with, I like the idea of custody of, of our heritage as well. And I think that sums that up perfectly. And that's what she's trying to teach us maybe who knows it's we read what we want what we can see in it <laughs> i'd buy that for sure mm-hmm. yes <laughs> i like to i like to comment that she made um about if teaching someone how to scry in other words you know and she said yeah. all oh, the scientific people will call it auto hypnosis and uh i like that she gives you the sort of psycho babble of the day if you will yeah. but is essentially teaching you how to do it you know just mm-hmm. the the gentle stare the dim light and mm-hmm. of course there's there's more to it in terms of intent or meditation or, or whatever else that you want to bring into it but generally people can scry in things without necessarily even realizing that they're doing it mm-hmm. uh terry pratchett had a wonderful example <laughs> one of the uh, weird sisters who would use the her her laundry washing <laughs> for her scry <laughs> So, right. <laughs> that you're in a sort of that that lucid state and you can see uh, like a, a reflection from of your inner psyche mm-hmm. and you can pick up all kinds of things wonderful things that you're subconscious and that's what you're actually seeing so the idea of using an an article for scrying which is supposed to be showing you what's inside your subconscious mm-hmm. and yet if it can contains something a sort of residue an energetic residue or if it's possessed if you will then it can if you're in that calmed meditative state and there's something coming at you it's also a heads up to protect yourself yeah so, that's the warning yeah that comes yeah. along that uh, that caveat <laughs> let's make sure that we take care of our objects as that translation would say but also that we take care of ourselves Um, as the object of the seer like we are the seer but we also see the seer in the object you know and they're seeing us back and we have to um, Mm. put up our own boundaries around that we know that Dion uh, that uh, that that Doreen was very um found felt that very strongly in her other writings about protecting yourself yeah what's the old thing about um if something if you need what's it if you need something, it it will find you. Or no, that's a saying about teachers, isn't it? You know, Maggie, you probably know what that saying is. Te- the student will find the teacher when they're ready to learn. Yeah, there you go. And oh, it could yeah. work with objects as well, though. Yeah. I think, yeah, the object will find the um, curator or the uh, the uh, carer seeker. seeker when it's ready to be found. Mm-hmm. when it's a student is ready the teacher will appear oh that's it yes that's it's, it's a Lao Tzu yeah. I think yeah ah, yes the the art of war no what so, am so, I saying yeah. that's my brief internet search tells me that <laughs> yes <laughs> that's the uh, saying yeah. speaking about protection and and warnings um as far as I understand Doreen differently from other witches from her time she was quite 
worried about this aspect. She was, I mean, uh, Ronald Hatton described described this this attitude as as um, oh, I don't know how to say it in English, credulity or something like that. Because he says he suggests that she was using newspaper she was interpreting what what she found on newspapers about bad witches yeah. uh, to the letter however I, th I find it very interesting because other witches of her time they would not believe in any negativity around sort of thing they would not believe in any negative groups while Doreen did so yeah. sort of thing and I wonder why I mean Doreen I've never met Doreen, however, from what she writes and, and the story, she doesn't seem to be a person who, what can I say, like a simple person. No. No. It's um, interesting. Uh, she, she was always looking for all the angles, I think. And Doreen was a person who had uh, a very clear um, understanding of what's mundane and what's the other side and not mundane and she was always uh, I see it a lot in what she writes is uh, the, the, the um, contrast between what's mundane flat maybe if you want to put a colour on it it's grey and then the magical world which is another thing altogether it's full of light and um, and also dark of course mm -hmm. She um, did mention that in one of her stories later yeah. on. Like, yes. It was, talks about the Fae and the, we can get to that part. But um, when yes. I was doing my studying of about Doreen for the, we did a, um, a talk, another Maggie, uh, a priestess from the East Coast. Uh, and I did a presentation about, um, about the, um, the charge of the goddess. And it seems like she, um, she did seem to, be willing to accept not only things, but people kind of the way they presented themselves. She was open-minded and, and, and gave people the benefit of the doubt, even when they had a bad reputation, even when they were maybe a little bit terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they didn't follow through or meet her standards, she would drop them. Yeah walk away from them you get it one, like, chance, one chance but that's it <laughs> yep. and and she was like okay show me what you got and then if you didn't follow if you didn't meet her standards bye mm. you know yeah. i'm walking away yeah and she did that more than one time uh, to individuals that i would be able to name but i think it's very interesting to say that you're right she does have this mm. openness but i think also she was protecting herself as well she was you know often on her own and, yeah. and as a woman and like that's kind of the thing that you would want to make sure that you were not mm -hmm. taken advantage of yeah magically or otherwise yes anyway yeah and she was a okay. feminist um and women's rights were very high on her um agenda of course mm. the the whole um the whole affect of the stories is sort of like um, undercurrent of unease or uncertainty and the objects and um, and the, the the lessons or the the warnings inherent in the stories. Were there any other things that came up for people as they were reading or things that that like little notes or bits that were of importance to you as you read? We can we can put aside the other ones if we want to wait until Dodi and if we haven't I, I I was prepared to talk about more than one story, but we can absolutely wait and talk about them later if that's better. Yeah, I'm happy with that. What do you think? Yeah, this is, we're nearly on an hour now. How's everybody mm -hmm. for time? That's what I was thinking too. We could yeah. probably dig in a little harder next time. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, I've got a, a, an appointment, another Zoom appointment that starts in four minutes. So I'm oh, gonna right. <laughs> okay. So we will <laughs> <Back> uh, <soon. laughs> we will say that the oh go ahead. Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 I'll make it quick. I just wanted to say that one thing that I found very beautiful in it was um, the fact that um, Ashton is the, uh, you know, the, the antiquary and has seems to have a much um, relaxed, much more relaxed existence, whereas Blake is this young executive is at a conference when he connects with Ashton and, and you know so high powered or did he say that the young men around him are interested in sex sports and something else you know so they're like the, this opposite these two opposites the yin and yang if you like but but it seems like Blake is learning to to see another side of life to um, to enjoy that relaxed state uh, not just learning, but also just to to to, to come into a, another way of looking at the world, a, a consciousness. So I, I really love that aspect of it that yes. is that they can they can do this, this balance each other. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Well, it's Maggie, what, what should I do with the recording? I'll just make it available on YouTube, like I did last time. Yeah, if that's okay, that would be wonderful. And Just private, we we'll give everyone the link. Yeah, yeah, and we'll plan to see everybody back here on uh, what would what do we say? April, April three. Yeah, April the third. Yeah, and is Can this I timing okay? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, the only question I had it's because I forgot and I didn't write it down. Which one was the short story I? Uh, offer to, to do. yes run in the book Marcos. does any yes. does anyone know <laughs> i i think what you said was you'd like to look at the book and so we have and we have many it. options so how about on email we all just say uh, the only one that's called is dodie scott wookie hole so that's what's going to yeah. be yeah, and then emlyn who's not here said he would like to also do a chapter does anybody else want to take take a chapter it's a wonderful Right, coming to the old oak chest. Oak chest. Yes. The old oak chest. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for organizing this. Be Thanks well for being everyone. here, being willing. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. It's lovely to meet you. Lovely yeah. to meet you all. So Talk glad to see you. Bye. Bye bye. Uh, that was so. Um, where were we'll go we? Go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop, I'll stop the recording.